And there we are. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cloud Chats. This is episode 32 on October 7th, 2021, titled Windows 11, GitHub Updates, and a Facebook Outage. And also, we should maybe have changed that title at the very end to And a Week of Outages. So Yeah. <laughs> well, good morning. My name is Mason, and these are my wonderful co-hosts, and I'm going to point the wrong direction at them, so good show. <laughs> as I do every time. So oh, this is Matt, Chris, and our special guest, Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Hey, hey. What's going on? Hello, awesome. Hey. So before we get started, let's talk about our Hello World Open this morning. What was the first cell phone you had? This one's going to be fun because I feel like this is going to date a few people on this show. Um, and also, like, not only... Cell phone? Uh, a le- phone that was not connected to the wall via a cable or had to be plugged in. Like, so, so like if you have like AT&T or Verizon or something like that, and also how old were you when you got it? Cause I feel if, like that's also going to be interesting. If you really want to date people, the other question you can ask is, have you ever not had a hardline phone? Yeah. Of course. Looking at you, Matt. I've got no, my like, office. okay. I'm staring at one. Oh, all right. Yeah, see, they're not as like they, they they still exist in some places. I guess the question would be, they, I, how how old were you when you got your cell phone? But also, what was your first cell phone? So, Chris, do you remember yours? I want to say it was one of the Nokia bricks, and it's probably still working. That thing's a tank. My mom had one. Um, it had like that green and black like weird screen and like super hard buttons and but my my first cell phone i remember when i got it i got it when i was in fifth grade so i would have been around 10 or 11 it's because i was going off to a camp for a week and my parents wanted me to to get in contact with them and i don't even know what it was it was a flip phone and like no idea didn't even use like usb usb micro or usb mini like this was pre usb days like they had their own special custom adapter um uh, and I was, yeah, I was like 10 or 11 when I got mine. So it was, I think, it, I think it was pro actually, I don't know. I have no idea what it was, but it was back then. I remember they, they pushed out like the razor and the marketing on the razor was fantastic. Cause they had that like blade, like falling through the air. Yeah. The razor. Like, wow. The razor came out when I was like in seventh grade. I think. And I remember everybody getting one, but they were expensive. They were like 200 something bucks and nobody back then could like warrant getting spending two hundred dollars on a phone. Like in those days, you, your 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 cell phone carrier used to give you the phone for free by buying the service, mm-hmm. and then like every two years you got an update and you just got a free new phone. And now that's totally Close not the, the case. Now now two hundred dollars for a phone is like the cheap end of the phone line, and now if you're buying like an iPhone or like a top of line Android, you're spending twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a phone. Oh yeah, you're spending laptop prices. Yeah, yeah, it's I basically just, a laptop. Yeah, I haven't bought a phone in a long time because every time I look at like a new iPhone nowadays, I'm like, I could just buy a MacBook for the same <laughs> price. I recently upgraded to an iPhone 12, and it's uh, yeah, I paid like twelve hundred dollars for it, so it's got to last a while. What about you, uh, Dennis? Do you remember your first yeah. portable phone or per self first cell phone that you had? Well, I surely remember it, but I don't know how old I was. Um... I, I remember that it was a gift from my father at the time. Uh, I really don't know what it was. I know it had games and I wanted to play games on it. So I didn't have to ask my parents, hey, can I borrow your phone to play a couple of games? So yeah, that's what I remember. But it had Snake and I mostly played Snake on it. I, snake you know, jam. my my <laughs> phone's never had games on it. Does anybody remember sending small media clips to their friends via bluetooth bluetooth or do you mean the red thing i infrared it, no it was actually bluetooth like we had bluetooth and like my like you would you would have like a 10 second clip because it's all your phone had a microphone that's all it would accept and then like i we you would turn on bluetooth and like link up with your friends and send each other weird sound clip. like i'm thinking back to junior high and i'm just cringing at it but <laughs> I also, it was also really funny um, because my first phone, whenever it didn't have, so if I turned it off and I turned it back on in an area where there was no service, it reset to Epoch. (laughs) 
Like That's I would so open, cool. I would open up my phone and I'd be back at January 1st, 1970. Oh my God. And I was That's like, cool. this is weird. Yeah. It's a weird, weird feature, weird feature. Uh, <clears throat> I want to say hey to everybody in chat. Uh, thank you uh, so much for joining us. Uh, Al Hiane, yeah. what's up? Welcome back. Uh, Baruz, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, Bert MB over on Twitch. Welcome. And uh, I saw something about the, yeah. Bert says the Nokia ringtone. It's like iconic at this point. Was that was in, that was in Jurassic Park? Was I don't even know what the Nokia ringtone is. Like, mm. if, I, if I I guarantee if I heard it, it would probably bring back all sorts of memories. But my brain has filed that away into cold storage, and it's not coming back. I still can't I remember what my first phone is. I'm struggling here. That must be a Gen Z problem. Do you remember when? Yes, I was 12 going into secondary school. And I got it mm. because I was going to secondary school. Okay, I feel like that's acceptable. I, I just, every now and then I see like four year olds that have phones and I'm like, this is not, this cannot be good for us. Um, well, that, it's, I yeah. mean, I got mine like leaving high school and that was like, ah, oh, you're, you know, college, whatever. But now, yeah, they're elementary school, like all for it. My first smartphone was the iPhone four. And I got it when I graduated high school, like up until then I had flip flown phones or then you had those ones that slid up that had like a full keyboard, which why Sidekick. did we need that? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. Like why? Well, I had the cheap version. I had like the $99 version from at and It was like, why did we need that? I was way qu quicker <clears throat> with T nine text than I was with anything else. I found it. Tact well, what, what is it, Matt? <laughs> Blackberry Pearl. Oh, okay. Let's see. Those are, okay. That's a good one. I think it might have been a gift from my dad at the time. Um, the reason oh. I just remembered it is because the the pearl in it was how you moved the cursor around and you could customize the lighting on it. It was like RGB oh, yeah. back in the day before RGB I for, was cool. I forgot about those. They had that weird like that wheel and you could that's so oh. Uh. <laughs> that was sweet. Yeah, I feel like old phones, you're definitely more productive. I Maybe missed because you had less bit. to do. Um, but yeah, tactile for day. Like, I'm surprised there's no nobody that's made like a little keyboard on top of touch phones. Yeah. I guarantee you I could find one somewhere. But I feel like texting, I feel like if you were going to text and do other things at the same time, it was a lot easier back then. Because you didn't have to look at your phone. Like, just the T9 text, the auto predict, you got so good at it. And then now it's like, my fingers off one millimeter and the whole message doesn't make sense. So, yeah, but the solution to that was uh, voice text, which totally solved that problem. <laughs> By the way, have you have you tried to use the uh, the drawing feature on the smartphones? Like, um, I want like to say hi, so I swipe from H to I, for example. I exclusively I, text like that. Do you? I can't get. It. I can't do it at all. Like. Just the, brain cannot deal with it. The I like the swipe stuff, but it's more often than not wrong. And then sometimes, like, it's weird how my brain will lazily skim over like one of the things. I think I hit it, and then I didn't, and it's like no, like this this swipe pattern, not this swipe pattern. And it's oh my Speaking goodness. Of patterns. My phone uh, realized that I'm laughing really hard when I type H A H A. So I just have to do this. And I can reply a full <laughs> line of ha-has. Brilliant. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, I one time wrote ha-ha-ha, like, H-A, like, 30 times back-to-back. -back. And now whenever I type in ha, it's like, oh, you want that one. And it always <laughs> does the long one. Oh, my gosh. That is really... <sighs> Phones, they're smart. We should be Wait. worried about the robots. Mason, we've got an important suggestion here from Frank. The intro music should be the Nokia ringtone. Uh, I'll look, I'll look if into we, if, it. If we're allowed to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that would just drive people away from the stream. Well, no, it wouldn't, because, you know, you'd hear it, and some repressed hey. part of your brain would go, I need to look at that. I need to deal with it. Yeah, this could also be the new intro to Back in My Day. Dream. It could be. It could be. I could add that in there if I can find it. Uh, Toon Army Captain says he had an NEC E808 in 2001, so... Like 2001, we, I didn't even know we had cell phones back then. I guess we did. Google's browser in 2001? I mean, they weren't great. The browser wasn't great. It was like IE3. Um, 
Or it was that well, it was that browser app that was called Browser. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not the best, not the Which, best. You know, I think to this to this day still ships on like Samsung phones and stuff. Just browser. Browser. The, way, uh, the intro. Speaking of intros, I saw that uh, there was a option. Uh, actually, I I don't remember. It was an information that pigeons were faster than the internet a short mm-hmm. while ago. So, do you know that there is a proposition? Uh, yes. Uh, RFC. Yeah. <laughs> it's my favorite RFC. Go ahead, it talk is about good. it. It is good. Yeah. Well, not sure how much I can talk about it. In my previous company, a guy showed it to me, and I was like, okay, right? Because I didn't know what RFCs are then. And he said, hey, man, you should read that. This is really interesting read. And I'm like, okay, right. I start reading uh, pigeons. Okay, yeah, it's like it's the R- <laughs> RFC for the data transmit. Uh, how to data transmit IP packets over avian carriers. Avian carriers. Yeah. Avian carriers. <laughs> um, and I think you're allowed to print the packet up to the length of the leg of the pigeon and you wrap it around it and you send the pigeon. And it has like all the math on how to calculate uh, p- avian carrier internet speeds. Yeah. The other really funny out- RFC. Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, no, I was about to say that it turns out that it is actually a joke. It's not a real proposition for RFC, but well, yeah. it's a real RFC. It is a joke, but it is it is officially it's an RFC. Wild, yeah. <laughs> yes, there's also the one that's called the evil bit, which is really funny. It's if you're ever doing anything bad, just turn on the evil bit. That way, we can turn on firewalls, and any packet that has the evil bit on automatically gets dropped. So if you're doing bad things, turn on the evil bit. Yeah. That would definitely happen. Definitely work. Sure. Uh, the RFC, RFC people are hilarious. They've got some. I mean, when you sit around writing internet specifications all day, you have to. Yeah, I, I was waiting for someone to make the Monty Python reference. So there it is. <laughs> Data compare of an of an African swallow. Oh my goodness. On oh. mo- oh, wait, so Toonami Campus says <laughs> on three mobile in Australia. It was a legit browser, but it did three. So in Australia, okay. But it did three G. You see, my brain in Australia kind of just get associated with awful internet speeds or no internet. So I'm surprised you had 3G on a mobile network in Australia that could do browsers in 2001. It is kind of interesting, but who knows? I'm Aust- yeah, Aust- no. Aust- it's a weird place. Before my time, so. I don't want to shut up. <laughs> 2001 before your time. I don't want to hear it, Matt. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into our guest interview with Dennis. So, Dennis, welcome to the show. Hey, hey. It's me Yeah, again. you again. Hey. No, not again. I mean, it's me for the first time, but again speaking after we started. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's good to have you. Uh, and go ahead and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, what's your, what's your current role? Uh, how did you get into tech? Those kind of fun questions. Yeah, right. Well, uh, I am currently doing DevOps stuff or how I like to say it, internet stuff, because I don't really know what I'm doing. I mean, I know what I'm doing, but uh, it's been happening on magic since I started, to be honest. Uh, It's been quite an interesting experience for me because before I started doing tech, I really thought that the tech industry is something really hard to get into and you have to know super a lot of stuff to actually work it and uh, get paid for it and i went to the netherlands to study for six months but i played fortnite full on all days (laughs) and i failed a lot of exams yeah at that time i really wanted to be a professional fortnite fortnite player and streamer so good uh, aspiration mm, no man i don't know uh it, it they are making a lot of money back then i don't know how much they are making now but you could leave. We can just check the. I, I was about to yeah. make a snarky comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll keep it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Better, better keep it. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I dropped out of university, came back to Bulgaria, and I was uh, thinking, what should I do with my life? I'm not okay doing IT because I failed. And I said, okay, one last push. I will try to work as a systems administrator. And then I applied for a job here without education, and uh, I actually got hired. And I don't know uh, how engaged you are with that person, but Bobby hired me at that time. Who is <laughs> who is oh, brilliant. <laughs> oh, we love Bobby. Ocean, yeah. Man, th- this person has helped me quite a lot throughout the years uh, with 
because you know when you don't have a person who is in IT, hi Bobby, yeah, he's in the in the chat. When you don't have a friend who is in IT, it is really hard for you to get the full picture how the uh, industry works. And he gave me uh, example uh, posts. He gave me some um, tutorials on how to do stuff and stuff like that. I get I got many inspirations from him to from him to build projects, and uh, I actually got really into IT, really into tech. And I started um, reading a lot more on myself. And that's why I am now in IT in this call with you guys. I, I, I wouldn't have known Digital Ocean if it wasn't for him as well. And what happened there is I asked him an HTML question. I asked him, hey, man, how does websites work? And he was like, OK, then uh, you have tags. And these tags, you can uh, assign uh, href to uh, a tag and you can go to a different link and I was like hmm, that's really interesting how can I make my own site and he said okay just go to DigitalOcean and deploy a droplet <laughs> so that's when I heard about DigitalOcean the first time and uh, that's been my journey I mean I can talk a lot more but let's keep it short for the time being no, no, we love we love talking about it stuff we're happy to keep keep going on some of it so it's mean, a really interesting journey like into tech yeah and it's one that we're hearing a, a lot more of these days. Like we're definitely hearing a lot more people that are getting into tech that don't have university education, which mm -hmm. is great. I love that because once you realize that all we are is really good Googlers, um, you realize you don't need an you don't need a degree for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's right. But uh, I have actually something to say, and I have a question. So, really yeah. good Googlers to 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 be a good Googler, you have to uh, know what you have to look for, right? Mm -hmm because you can't Google how to do that and instantly magically get it in front of you. Uh, but anyway, my question was um, in, uh, are you all three from uh, the United States? Oh, no, Matt, I think is from the UK. Yes, I'm in the UK. <laughs> yeah. did, the accent, did the accent give it away? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I was about to ask, is it possible, uh, not possible, but how hard it is for you to do IT without education in your education system and your uh, place of residence. I don't think it's. Uh, I think I don't think it's that difficult. I mean, it so it depends. Um, once you have experience, I mm -hmm. feel like the education thing kind of gets thrown out the window. So if you have a couple of years of like experience and you can you have a GitHub repository and stuff, you can get quite a few jobs. I mean, I know. Um, Chris, wasn't your cousin doing? Didn't didn't she like start doing a like like boot camps and stuff? And like, doesn't have like, does she have? Does Lynn have formal education in computer science? No, she uh, came from pharmacy, and then she's always done design. And um, yeah, so no, she didn't even do a boot camp. Uh, my wife did come from. Um, she was a flight attendant, and then went to a boot camp and uh, went that way. But yeah. I didn't even, in, in our education system, we, there's not much, especially the lower levels, to talk about IT or coding or anything like that, at least when I grew up. Um, so all of my stuff is self-taught as well outside. Yeah, I mean, in the UK, we do have computing taught throughout school, but they only teach you like, really basic fundamentals, like, hello, you know, computing is a whole area that you can do. Um, I, I was very self-taught. I am doing a degree in computing at university currently, and it's probably one of the most pointless things I've spent my life doing. But, um, Don't figure about this, right? Yeah, I say I'm very much on board with the idea that if you have experience, you can get hired, and education doesn't matter. I've worked with a, quite a few people that don't have degrees, um, that have high school educations, that got into tech. Um, uh, Toon Army Captain, I think, also, if I remember correctly, he also uh, has a similar story to yours, Dennis. And he says it's hard. It, it says it's hard because someone has to give you the opportunity. Um, but I feel like once you have that first opportunity, then once you have experience, once you have a portfolio, it just kind of goes from there. Now, some now some it depends on also the recruiting tool. Like sometimes, like recruiting tools filter out based on arbitrary educational requirements. But I don't think there would be such a large boot camp industry if it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and what so, do you think about the attitude in their interviews? Because when you go to your first interview, you are uh, you don't have uh, much to say. I mean, it's your first tech interview. What is expected from you? What do you think about the attitude 
do you have to lower yourself and say, I don't want that much money and I want to learn? Or do you think that you're fine with, I will get the money that everybody's getting and I will still learn fine enough? I think it, I think at that point it becomes a, a company by company basis. So mm -hmm. most likely you're still going to be subjected to algorithm questions. So like if say you go do a, a front end boot camp, unfortunately some companies will still subject you to the invert this binary tree. Which you want to know how many times in my career I've ever had to manually invert a binary tree? Never. <laughs> yeah, zero <laughs> useless information. Useless like which is I don't know, but I think it uh. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. I think it works. I, I do think that there, there are opportunities. The thing is, is right now there's more open jobs than there are people to fill them. So if you can prove you can do the work, you can do it. I do often tell people, though, that like if you are going to not get the degree, like 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 uh, Tune Army Captain said, it's going to be a little bit harder because you have to get someone to believe in you from at the very beginning. But once you've done that, like my yeah. one of my friends literally... He worked, at, he worked in telecommunications back in the 70s, has a high school degree. He helped lay almost all of the internet fiber lines in Austin, and he was the one person who taught me everything I know about building operating systems. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. So, yeah, like we built, we used to roll our own, at my first job, we rolled our own custom version of Linux, and like he was the one who was in charge of like all of the build process and stuff, and it was really cool. Wasn't there a book about this? Uh, what was it? Linux from scratch, I think. It was no, there's probably books about everything, yeah, but like books, books and experience definitely go a different like because sometimes you don't need all that stuff, and sometimes you need stuff that's not in the book, which I have mm -hmm. I have done that before. I've run across times when there are things that are not in the documentation, and you get to go you get to go co code hunting. <laughs> I will just say as well, I'm going to do this because I know I advocate for open source all the time. Have a GitHub profile, work on projects, make them public, have the code out there. The amount of times I get an email from someone that's just looked at my GitHub profile and then I get a recruitment email that just references the GitHub profile and nothing else. Like, that will get you noticed and will show that you have experience. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. But isn't it hard for people to uh, go out there? Because, you know, with all that, uh, the imposter syndrome, if I may say it like this, I don't know if it's this what, uh, what I want to... Uh, get here, but when you just start in IT and you add code to your GitHub repo, aren't you scared that the code is not good enough and it will actually push interviewers away? Uh, you get that. You get that with the degree too. Yeah. Imposter, I mean, like, imposter syndrome isn't exclusive to people without degrees. So if you dig, if you dig on my GitHub far enough back, you'll see some terrible PHP. I'm sure. Oh yeah, I've got but, some know, bad code. But back I, when that was relevant, you know, it was showing. You know, I can write PHP. I have at least some skill. Yeah. And on, honestly, on that point, like you're going to look at somebody that has a GitHub profile with bad code, but you would never look at somebody without a GitHub yeah. profile. Um, you are and right. on, on top of code, I'm a big proponent of uh, written tutorials, like putting yourself out there that way. Right. Um, and that also brings in a lot of imposter syndrome on, you know, who's going to yell at me for this one thing I wrote, but <laughs> It's better to get or out there. Or when your tutorial gets outdated and the person just says, hey, it's not working anymore. Can you fix it? Can you <laughs> update it? And then you just yeah. like... That's when you slap the Hacktoberfest <laughs> repo on it and you're like, pull request accepted. <laughs> you can yeah. fix it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's pretty That's pretty cool of, a, of an adventure you've had there, Dennis. But yeah, I think so it's good to have you here. So I guess I would ask like, so you're one of our navigators. So that if for those of that haven't heard of our navigators program, our navigators program is our really, in, I guess I'd say our really involved community members. Uh, you can apply at do.co slash navigators uh, to be kind of like one of our extended DevRel members. And Dennis is one of them. So uh, how did you decide to apply for the NAVS program? All right. <laughs> Here comes Bobby again. Uh, but <laughs> so... Uh, what happened when I started at my previous company and he showed me that I can create a droplet and I can put HTML on it so the world can see it. He said, do you know that you can actually help people out in the community of DigitalOcean? And I am there like, okay, I can help people out if I know how to help them, but I don't know. And he continues with, well, the questions are not uh, really that complicated some of the times there are people who are switching to IT to tech and they need a little bit of helping hand and then I started answering questions in the community 
I answered a few and then something really strange happened that I received an email from DigitalOcean that uh, basically says, we will send you swag. We will send you some uh, credit and you can buy whatever you want from our swag store. And I am now wearing the shirt and the sweatshirt that I got what? from DigitalOcean. And this is what made me believe in, uh, in all of this, that tech is happening and I can work whatever I want as long as I have a computer in front of me. So then I saw the Navigators program that um, got launched. Bobby said, uh, told me a little bit more about it and said, uh, they just suggested me that I apply. And I applied and then uh, I am now here with you. Well, what I like about the Navigators program is that uh, you get a lot of support from people that are doing a lot of the stuff that have done a lot of the stuff already. For example, I want to get into community. I want to get into public speaking. I want to express myself and show myself to the world. But I am not so sure uh, about it myself. And then I got all the help from Digital Ocean, and now I am here on this live stream with you guys. So this is one thing. The other thing is that you have direct connection to uh, to people from Digital Ocean stuff that are engaged with the company in so many ways. I mean, it's it's wonderful. I, I can't say a bad word about Navigators. Uh, the thing I can say that is a little bit confusing for me is that I want to contribute a lot, but when I start thinking of ways to contribute, I get a little bit of uh, imposter syndrome. I get a little bit of fallback. And then I say to myself, no, don't do that. You are a Navigator. They are here to help you. And uh, being here on this live stream is actually that door that I needed to push to start. Fantastic. Well, we did hear you just say that you want to do more stuff. So congratulations. This is a this is a buy one, get four free deal. So you did one <laughs> live stream. Now you signed up for four more. Um, <laughs> because we're we're constantly uh, doing a lot of stuff. And I'm glad that you're that you're contributing and all that. I'm super excited to see what you come up with. And yeah, we, we write about whatever you want, like write about stuff that, that I, I think the tip that I found when it comes to like finding topics to write for and all of that is write about stuff that makes you that you're excited to write about. Don't worry if someone else has written it. I think Chris has a really good uh, like lesson that he's taught me and he walked off screen. So apparently his rabbits are doing something wily in the background. Um, Chris has very rambunctious rabbits. If you didn't know uh, is, is there a, uh, what, what's Chris's say? There's no, there's no unique messages, only unique authors. And messengers, like messengers. I'm sorry, I messed it up. You, gotta, ah. you can't miss the alliteration. It's very important. <laughs> okay, well, it's I don't know. It's one like I learn a lot from all of my colleagues, and that's one of the things I learned a lot from Chris. Um, so don't worry if anyone else has done it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and and to that point, like if if the idea is don't start anything, don't write anything, don't write code because it's already been done before. Nobody would ever do anything ever because everything's already been done. Um, yeah. But yeah, you can put your twist on it and you can find your niche and your people that like it. That's that, you know, a thousand true fans thing. Uh, yeah. Just carve out your little Careful. section of this internet. I want to say you I mentioned think, community yeah. and that we sent you swag for it. I've just looked at your community profile. 56 answers. That's a good number. Mm, yeah, but uh, let's, uh, I mean, it is a good number for people that are not cycles you know what kinds of people there are with i mean thousands of okay thousands just because of just because just because bobby and kamal don't do anything but answer Dino <laughs> questions doesn't mean that you have to answer as many questions as bobby and kamal yeah, okay if, if if anybody compares themselves to bobby we're gonna look pretty bad yeah <laughs> i think Bob, the, uh, matt does, does is it who does bobby have the most answered questions like he's no, one of the it's i think it's still kamal but bobby has like it won't load for me, but I think it's roughly three thousand answers. Yeah. Okay. Not everybody's Bobby, and also for those, <laughs> we've had we've had Bobby on the on the show before, and now that we keep talking about it, it means we need to bring him back. Um, so if you're still listening, Bobby, guess what? You're going to get a message from me real soon. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess summary of what we've just talked about: like, get out there, do it. Don't be afraid. Try it out. See what happens. Awesome. Well, I guess let's. You have anything else you want to say, Dennis, before we move on to the rest of the show? Any final parting words? Yeah, I don't want to scare people that Bobby has or other people has so many answers. I got my email from DigitalOcean that uh, 
I am engaging in the community on my 10th answer or something like that, 7th, 10th, I don't mm -hmm. know. Just engage, like Matt said, engage. It is helping people. Yes, yeah, no, okay, I, we, we, I get I, answers from that sometimes. <laughs> it's my favorite program to run. Uh, yeah, if you answer, like, I think we do five questions on community, we'll send you an email um, with some surprises inside. Ooh, well, now we're going to have to go answer some questions. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for the interview, Dennis. And now we're going to move on to our next section, which is the news flash. And this is the wonderful section every week where we talk about all the fun things in news. And boy, oh boy, have there been fun things this week. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to go ahead and go on up. And whenever you hear this sound at the end, it means we're moving on to the next piece. And uh, the new little section we've added in here that I've really liked is our weekly releases section. We have two. So, well, I don't know. It's kind I don't of a blur. Know. Yeah, I don't know. We have Python 3.10 got released. Um, super excited. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Python is on a yearly release schedule now. So like it does, like these, these just keep on coming. But they've added a couple of cool new features uh, to Python. Structured pattern matching is actually pretty interesting. I haven't... Um, actually uh like had the time to funk like mess around with it but i know they're wor they've worked a lot on that um and then one of the ones that really got my attention and this is only because i've dealt with it so much is that they've deprecated dist utils which dist utils is the oldest package on how to or one of the elder packages with for building your python uh projects like building them as like a wheel or an installable um and dist utils has been deprecated and i've sprinted with this team at pycon before and they've been talking about deprecating dist utils since at least 2017 uh oh, wow. pro probably earlier um so i i mean and i remember i was in the room with the discussions i know how much work it was to get to this point so super excited for that it means they're finally moving away to full towards fully uh setup tools which is exciting yeah, no, so uh, I, I looked through this and match seems really cool. It seems like a almost a more powerful switch statement because Python's never had switch. Yeah. Um, and the other one that really caught my attention actually was just precise line numbers for debugging and other tools. When you have an error, the errors are now a bit better. Yes, I have heard that they've got that the error error checking was or the error reporting was a lot better. Yeah, which I think is a great thing for people getting into Python. And it's obviously, you know, Python's used for education all the time. Um it just it makes it a bit more accessible now. Yeah, that's exciting. I, I like that because I've uh, I've made a lot of mistakes in Python and sometimes I need a little bit more help. So and then our next release this week is Windows 11. Remember when we were told that Windows 10 was the last Windows release ever? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turns out the lie detector test determined that was a lie. So <laughs> um, we now have Windows 11. And honestly... I don't know. I was excited for Windows 10. I, I'm, I'm very mad about Windows 11. I've just, I've heard they've, they've done a couple of weird things where like certain links only ever open in Bing. We'll go talk about that some more. Oh, uh, my God. oh wait, I is that this uh, Windows management thing is like leaps better than what yeah. it was? But yeah, honest, by the way, go for it. Uh, yeah, yesterday uh, or the day that it got released, sixth, I think it was. I thoughts to myself, I said to myself, I am going to install Windows 11 now. And I go and I install it. And I opened Google and I sat for a while and realized maybe this is not the, great, uh, the greatest of ideas. Maybe not everything will work the way I want it to work. So I will wait. I will wait a little while <laughs> before uh, upgrading to 11. Yeah, so I'm curious but if anyone I, chat's upgraded yet. <laughs> I really wanted to upgrade because I really like new new stuff. Whenever I see something gets an upgrade uh, update uh, of new UI, new interface, new colors, I, I love it. I dig it really mm -hmm. much, but yeah. Yeah, I'm not the fan of like them integrating teams and all that stuff, like right into the taskbar. I feel like they're really pushing that stuff. Yeah. They've been, they've been doing that forever. Like literally when you used to buy the Microsoft suite for your company, it's like, here's Microsoft Office. We'll give you a 30% discount if you take teams for free. Mm -hmm. Um, it's 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 like a back alley person like hey you want to buy a watch like nobody wants teams and they haven't gotten that message yet i've spoken um, to people that use teams uh like more the enterprise like healthcare type companies and they're like oh we love teams and i'm like mm. my, uh, <laughs> i know i know a few people so and i've i've so i 
Kyle here says Microsoft Discord, please use our service. Um, I know that uh, Kyle's a friend of mine. I know that Kyle explicitly writes, used to write plugins for um, Teams, and it is not fun, and he doesn't like it. So I don't know. I used it back in 2017, and I don't need it, and I don't ever want to use it. So that is a little bit irritating, but I'm sure that we'll find some sort of registry key to disable that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two army captain makes a very interesting point here. They're going to get a lawsuit again. Yeah, hold that thought. We'll talk about it again in a few minutes. <laughs> Wait, is there already another? Okay, I yes. guess we have. Okay, we're going to move on because apparently we were getting ahead of ourselves. So let's move <laughs> on to our actual news, the non-release section of the news. Uh, so the first one we have is GitHub Pages has IPv6 support, which is great. I oh, love. So this seeing... We're blurring the line because this is almost just a release thing. Um... Oh, well, we should have a very long time. Okay, we're going to pretend like this. this was in the release section. Hold on. I just love this blog post. It's like well, it's one line. <laughs> it's one line that links out somewhere else, which I it's find kind of irritating. But... Well, it's just a blog post saying it's enabled. Go read the docs. <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> Can you possibly like complain it. about someone telling you to go read docs? <laughs> no, but I feel like if you're going to do a blog post, you, like, you could have done it there, I feel. Yeah, but so. zero fluff. I'm all about it. Okay, yeah, that's that's fun. And then GitHub releases a new UX UI because, of course, they do. Because every time Hacktoberfest comes around, I have to re-record assets for GitHub. So well, this only affects the GitHub releases. releases. Yeah. Um, so I don't think it, I don't think it'll break any of your stuff. Um, but yeah, they've done a whole load of improvements to both the UI and the UX uh, for releases. You can also generate release notes now, which is really cool. It just goes through all the commits between the last tag and the current tag. So nice. and generates a standard format for them. Um, and the releases page is oh. just being cleaned up a load. That's interesting. I'm looking forward to that. I, I haven't done like I actually have to work on. So is this in beta or is this released already? Uh, so it's feature preview. Um, so okay. kind of beta. Um, if you just Public go into beta? the settings menu, you can go to feature preview and enable it. Um, okay, I'll I'll probably deal with it later then because I have I know I needed to cut a release on the Hacktoberfest topic applier tool because uh, but I haven't had time to do that yet so I was wondering if I would see it but we shall see yeah Let's and try it out uh, yeah looks cool uh, Firefox ninety three will perform smart tab unloading I don't know what that means uh, well so everyone knows that browsers love to use RAM. Um, curse of the browser essentially at this point um and in firefox 93 it's going to start kind of doing a bit more monitoring of its ram usage uh, and will start unloading tabs in the background if you're using too much memory which is interesting use... because edge does that already edge done that since the beginning yeah i use that feature in edge and it does fantastic compared to chrome like i have tab sleep after five minutes um are you still using Edge? Like you, we we talked about it in the previous cloud chats that you had moved over to Edge. So are you still loving it? Any updates still, on that? Still loving it. Honestly, there's almost no difference uh, aside from the sleeping tabs thing. Um, actually, I'll, I'll take that back. There are a few like uh, quality of life improvements that I can't think of the top of my head, but I remember thinking, wow, that's so much nicer. Um, but try Edge. I like you're saying you're using Edge whilst we're looking at Chrome. I use Chrome for the work stuff and then oh, okay. Edge for the personal stuff. Yeah. That's, By the way, good. do you know that uh, I don't know if I read it somewhere uh, these days, but Windows 11 actually has something in Edge that makes it impossible to open it in other browser. We're coming up on that one we in the next talk, one. We, about it. <laughs> <laughs> we keep getting right. ahead of ourselves. We should have moved that one up. We should have moved um, yeah, we should have. Um, and our next story comes out of the land of, oops, I did it again. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure people have heard about this one because it kind of affected a lot of the internet. Um, Facebook disappeared. Yes. And a whole bunch of people had to learn about what BGP is. Yeah. And those of us that have actually studied and played with BGP are woke up from our thousand year slumber. And we were like, finally, it's the day we get to talk about BGP. Yeah, so, so and yeah, the TLDR for anyone that doesn't know BGP essentially tells everything on the internet like where an IP address goes. You have DNS that kind of translates the wordy name into an IP address, and then BGP kind of says this IP address goes to this physical place. 
Yes, and it's you, and it, there's there's not as much BGP in the world as like there. It's large companies, large corporations, uh, countries, universities, and stuff. They're associated with what are called autonomous zones, and there's not as many as you would think. Mm -hmm. um, they're very large chunks of the internet. So when a, when a BGP route disappears, it causes cataclysmic errors because other things sometimes route through them, and then basically it turns into this network black hole where the packets are never seen from again. So it, uh, you don't hear BGP in the news that often. And I, it was, it was, I mean, you know, hug ops to the Facebook team, but I was, I was enjoying the, uh, the, the day. So when you see BGP in the news, you know, something's gone really wrong. <laughs> Something goes really wrong. I think the last time I remember it being in the news, like was like, I think s some country in the middle East accidentally hijacked Google. Cause BGP yes. is really interesting because it has no security and no checks. You just announce your route and it's there. Um, and I remember like a middle Eastern country accidentally announced Google's IP range and everything, half the world's Google traffic was being routed through some random country. <laughs> yes, so they, I think it was mainly YouTube that was affected. Um, yeah. But prior to that, there's been quite a few BGP instances, generally around route hijacking. Um, mm -hmm. Route poisoning. Speaking, there was one a year speaking. ago where like, I'll go for it, Dennis. I am interrupting your mouth for the second time. I'm really sorry. But uh, speaking of BGP, uh, do you guys believe that Web3, the whole hype around Web3 is possible, that BGP will get replaced eventually? Seeing as how we're still 40 years into the adoption of IPv6, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I have a, I, I'm very much there with I say, same boomer opinion. No, not for a very long time. Yeah, it's it's not. I don't even know if it's a boomer opinion. It's it's just that like if you ever want to buy a tech book, that the data inside of it will never go bad. Buy something in networking because mm -hmm. it takes so long. Now there's a lot of amazing advances that happen in networking, but getting because it's physical hardware, getting the world to update to where it supports all of these things takes so long that literally, I mean, like we we've been adopting IPv6 since like what the 80s, um, and like we're literally coming in on 40 years on it. I think. But so again, IP, IPv6, uh, yeah. didn't we start adopting it because IPv4 addresses will eventually end? Isn't that yeah, the reason? We did. We ran out and we're still not there yet. Yeah. Like, so I, we, the Web3 is an interesting conversation and that would almost be its own section. But no, I don't, I, I know how slow things move in networking space and I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, so I, right. I think it's an interesting bubble to kind of watch, but it's it's very much an isolated bubble currently. Yeah, but that's not saying that it can't happen because weirder things have happened in the world, yeah. for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm not going to say no, but I I'm going to say it's going to take a long time. We might we might all be old people by the time we get there. <laughs> uh, our next story is the one that we keep talking about, that's and we're finally here. <laughs> Is Firefox and Brave are to intercept Microsoft Edge only links. So apparently in Windows 11, certain links, instead of saying like HTTPS colon double backslash, it says micro, what Microsoft dash Edge, and they require you to open the link in Edge, which is this is 100% going to lead to a lawsuit. Yeah. So um, Microsoft Edge is now registering its own custom URI scheme, Microsoft dash Edge, uh, and certain bits of Windows 11 are using that URI scheme to get around your default browser preference. Which is interesting. Wait a second. And yeah, and then so Firefox and Brave thought of the very simple solution here. They're also just going to register that URI scheme. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Go ahead, Dennis. Uh, I I didn't had enough Teams meetings with clients to know how to jump in the conversation. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I wanted to say is um, that I don't know how lawsuits are made about this. Do you know what? what are there regulations for this? Can okay, they so just I'm, we are going to we are going to say right now we are not lawyers. We have no tie to anything. This is our we're, this is our opinion based on our limited knowledge of anything. I have a feeling not legal advice. this is not legal advice in any way. Do not take this. You cannot you cannot. But like this. This is the kind, these are the kind of actions that lead to antitrust. Yes. Like that's what happens is basically whenever you start, whenever you start explicitly removing competition, that tends to make, at least in the United States, it makes the, the people that monitor the, the, you know, trusts and monopolies go, Hmm. So they're, they're, and they've been edging closer to this free ha pun. Um, 
been, <laughs> they've, they've been etching closer to this ever for for a while now um so, and, and it almost feels like some of the tech companies are definitely like just trying to see how much they can get away with so i have a feeling that and like this is this has happened in the past i mean I they gave internet explorer away for IE, free yeah. Yeah, they get so I think like you used to have did you used to have to pay for brow browsers? Would you have to pay for net like it was the battle between Netscape and IE? And then I think when they just started including IE as the default and uh, yes. for free, that's what brought in the last big antitrust that like hit Microsoft. I, saying, I think it was um, also just around the fact, yeah, it was, IE was bundled as part of the system and it never yeah. really gave the opportunity to choose a different browser. Yeah, and that and they got they actually got like fined for that, and like they got for twenty years. And I remember this 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 antitrust like cease and desist expired like in the early twenty tens. So we're seeing it come back around, which is not surprising. So we yeah. shall see what happens. I like that Brave and Firefox are going for the simple solution here of just also registering the ROI scheme. <laughs> yep. Well, I use Brave, so we're good. It's not going to affect me. Hopefully, you know, I dislike uh, that they had to do it in the first place. I do, but mm. it is what it is. Our next story comes out of the land of me not being able to hit a button. Um, or maybe I hit it twice. I don't know. It Remember, I can't nice. I can't hear these things, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, Google is reportedly developing its own CPUs for Chromebooks, which is interesting. Everyone wants their own CPU now. It's ridiculous. It actually is, but I don't know how I feel about it. Is this a lot think... of because of the shortage? Like, I, they I think know. they can I've control their own it. supply chains. I think it'd be quite interesting, though. Um, my only reason to think it might be interesting is, given the Chromebook literally runs a browser and nothing else, I wonder what weird optimizations they can make. Um, I guarantee you it also has something to do with vendor lock and vendor support. Mm-hmm. But it is that is interesting because like you know we've and the, the fun thing is, is like it, this is how the landscape used to be like if we go back to the nineties like we had Spark PCs we had Power PC which was by IBM like everybody used to make their own processor until like we kind of consolidated on Intel and AMD was kind of struggling in the background now AMD is very much into the forefront ARM processors are becoming a really big thing I mean isn't the M1 an ARM processor? Am I right? Am I wrong? Uh, we'll double check that. I think is the M1 is thing? ARM. I thought it was think, his own thing. But I think it's based off of ARM. It could be. I was saying, this also mentions that Google's based of theirs off ARM by it, the sounds of it as well. It is an ARM-based chip. Yeah. So we're still we're, we're just we're seeing we're seeing competition in the in the processor space, which is gonna be interesting, but we'll see what happens. I'm 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 hopefully optimistic, but I also know they'll probably end up using using it for you know malicious intent. And so. I don't know. I'm excited. I think that it's always just been AMD and Intel fighting. Um, it'll be interesting to spice it up. Yeah, and the, like the integration has never been the greatest, but like seeing it with the M1 of how you know hardware and chip and software can kind of come together. Because really, Chromebook, in theory, that should be all we need, right? Like it's yeah. Yeah. In in theory, but I've never been able to make that theory last. Right. And I'm hoping the chips at least get us a little closer cuz Yeah. They've been promising a while now. If you could give me a browser and a terminal, that's all I would need. But like being able to do like v, or VS code in a in a browser where I could run it locally cuz I don't I don't want to always have to be connected to the internet. I still travel in areas where there's not a lot of internet and I might want to do offline things. So that's why I kind of somewhat well, reject in, the browser in theory you could do that right because vs code can run in a browser so presumably you could give it pwa bindings to use a local file system i think code sandbox works um without internet oh cool there you go mason interesting i haven't looked into it i also don't need to buy my i don't need to buy another computer like i need to not spend more money and y'all seem like y'all are pushing me towards it so boo do it buy it. not just us the world now the world this whole <laughs> yeah buy more stuff and our last one comes out of oops yeah, <laughs> another, so this is the other big headlines you might have seen the last week <laughs> yeah um apparently the entirety of twitch has been reportedly leaked <laughs> and usually when there's leaks it does not include source code so this one's pretty interesting um, but things like source code cr i think the big one is the creator payouts that one's yep. definitely um yeah interesting mobile client like everything 
was was leaked yesterday. So if you have a Twitch, please change your password. Yes, change your password, enable 2FA. Um, if you have a Twitch account, you've also got an email today telling you your stream key has been rolled. Um, yep. That was a precautionary measure done by Twitch. But yeah, it's insane. It's just so much. Wait, Wait. I didn't see this one. The Steam competitor? Oh, that's not good. <laughs> I think the one that I'm interested in is the Twitch's internal red team tools. I like red team tools. I think they're really fun, and it's also cool to see that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So this is—it's not just like a one-time snapshot of the source code. They're proper Git repos with full commit history. Wow, that is interesting. I—I'm looking forward to hearing how this happened because I guarantee you it's going to be a fascinating story. Yes, I, say, I look forward to it. Twitch. I think the only thing Twitch has said so far pretty much is just, yes, there was a leak. We're aware. We're, de we're dealing with it. As someone who's been on the other side of data leaks and stuff like this, I, I, I feel, feel for you. I feel yeah. sorry for you because you're not going to sleep for about six months. Have fun. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Well, that's all the time we have today for the news. Let's go ahead and move into our game of true or false today. And let me share my screen. So today, as always, we're playing a game of true or false. This is where I present everyone with 10 statements regarding any topic, even remotely regarded with tech. And you have to tell me if this statement is true or false. The code for the game today is 5677017. And I'm going to put the banner up. Feel okay. free to join and the winners will get a Sammy sticker pack. You have to yeah. email me and I will ship you some stickers. And while we're waiting... We'll talk about the co the word of the day, which is DNS. So we have another. Uh, this kind of relates to the BGP hack, um, because as part of the BGP uh, issue, the domain records for all of Facebook were wiped from the internet. So what is DNS? Um, DNS is the domain name system, and you can kind of think of it as the phone book of the internet. And yes, Matt, I am reading the Cloudflare page. Um, oh, good. You know, when it comes to learning about networking concepts, Cloudflare's website does a great job with it. Um, so basically, when you say phone book of the internet, this is what translates what you know as like Google.com into the IP address of where it should go. So things like, you know, DigitalOcean.com would be translated by the DNS system and it would point to an IP address and that and it would take you there and... You would basically get it. Now, there's a lot more. There can be a lot more complexity to it. Like you couldn't just memorize Google's IP address and then just go there because Google implements rolling IP addresses in dynamic DNS. Um, but like, if you were to say create your own website, like I have Mason.dev, I would build my website probably on a DigitalOcean droplet, maybe on App Platform. It depends on how lazy I'm feeling that day. Um, and then I would buy the domain Mason.dev, which I already own. .dot dev domains are expensive. I don't like that. And then I would create an A record and a quad A record, which was also from our chat earlier today, our little intro, to create an IPv4 and IPv6 address. And then when you go to mason.dev, it would take you to my website. And the DN if I didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to go there. So that is what DNS is. Are there any questions or anyone want to add anything to DNS? No, not really. Yeah, yeah if you got it from Cloudflare, it's good. Translate well, the first word in an IP address. Yep. Yep. It's very often whenever people start wanting to make their websites, um, I feel like people stumble a little bit on it. Like, because it's, it's you know, you think server and build a website, but then you don't realize you have to have the secondary service. Um, purchasing domain names can be really cheap if you can find a .com that you want. Um, like mason.dev is a five letter domain, which is why it costs so much. Um, it's also very broad. Like I'm not the only Mason on earth that is a developer, but I yeah. won that auction. <laughs> So, I also think the cheapest, time? the cheapest TLD currently is like dot XYZ, I think, and it's like a couple of dollars for a year. Yeah, and be careful. Once you start using getting domain names, you'll buy them for all of your projects, and then you'll have this graveyard of t of domain names that you never touch. Um, that but, that but renew one every year. Make it. One could make it, but they renew every year, and then eventually you end up being like me, and you get a roughly three to four hundred dollar domain bill every year. Yeah, you forget wow. that they renew. Yeah. yeah, it's a sad. I bought a couple of IOs. That was a mistake, but I don't want to give them yeah. up because the IOs, at least on name.com, like renew for like 50 bucks a year. And then I I've, get 
have you reached the point yet where you have a spreadsheet keeping track of your domains where they're registered <laughs> and how much they renew for? No, I only have one re registrar. I have not. I I I used to bounce, and I found I was like, no, I'm consolidating. So I know exact. I know all that because I log into the name.com dashboard and look. Okay, but yeah. no, I'm not there yet. Yeah, I know Bobby has .sh, which is pretty cool, as in shell scripts. So, yes, we're nerds. We get it. <laughs> and we're going to we go stop? ahead and start. Um, I haven't told you the theme. This week's yeah. theme is databases, which oh, I'm surprised God. we've gotten this far. We haven't done it. I love how Matt goes, oh, no. I spent Is all it... morning arguing my lecture about database issue. Well, good. You can argue with me about this. <laughs> First question. A row and a table represents a record. This is weird. There should be a picture there, but we'll oh, see what happened. I like it. A, does a row and a record represent... Does a row and a table represent a record? Yogan says, I love DBs. Honestly, me too. That was one of my favorite classes. I'm glad someone does, because I don't. <laughs> of course, my database class was how to build a DBMS, not actually how to use one. Ah, uh, yes. Ours, ours was modeling, and now I, I see the world differently. There was a little bit of modeling and I did okay with that. And I do say that part helped, but as soon as we got into B plus trees, I was like, you're done. We're done. Yeah, like we don't know. No one needs to know about a B plus tree. So the answer to that was true. Agent yak up top, groovy Griffin and gentle seal. And looks like we're, we've got a lot coming in. So Matt, oh, say your quick, say, say your famous thing. line, say the it's line. It's not Matt. just about getting it right. It's about being fast. The fast you are, the more points you get. I swear, does anyone has anyone ever seen Shrek 3 and there's that little kid that's going, do the roar? And I feel like that's what we do with Matt with that statement. It's like, Matt, say the thing. <laughs> Next question. SQL stands for Standard Querying Language. Okay, so apparently I just forgot the picture on the first one. Does SQL stand for Standard Querying Language? Standard Query Language. It doesn't stand for Squirrel? It does not stand for squirrel. Okay. This Squirting. is false because I make this mistake every time. It stands for structured query language. It's not standard. I make this mistake every time because I feel like it's standard at this point. But it stands for structured. So, uh, Agent Yak coming up with social sloth and eager sable. Is that an animal? Yep. Okay. Really? But I'm glad that we have an honest dragon. Beats the dishonest dragons. So. <laughs> Next question. MySQL and Postgres are examples of document databases. Oh, a sable's so cute. Yeah, I just Googled it. It's like a it's red cool. panda. Yeah. <laughs> are MySQL and Postgres examples of document databases? I'm sorry that we went on a sable. <laughs> it's like somewhere between an otter and a red panda. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's cute. I'm surprised there's there's no like tech mascot for this yet. Yeah, Okay. Everyone got this correct. I am very proud of you all. No, MySQL and Postgres are not document databases. They are relational databases. Eh. Ah. But everyone got it. So nothing, nothing exciting happening on the leaderboard. A column is the smallest unit of storage in a relational data. That should say relational database. In a relational database. Is a column the smallest unit of storage in a relational database? These also might be one of the easier true or falses because I will admit that I am not a database expert. Um, <laughs> so this might be some of the easiest ones you've ever had to deal with. This is true. A column represents one piece of information about an object. Every column has a name and a data type. So like whereas a row is something else, a column is the smallest singular. This is not like the smallest data type. This is the smallest unit. So I feel so. like you're going to get someone in chat in a minute. It's going to get really angry that I know that like smallest integer or maybe just I know. a single and I'm, field. And I'm sorry. I come back next week and try to win again. That's all I can <laughs> say. Um, so, next question. An operation where the rows of one table are related to the rows of another table through a column common column values is called a join. What? That's hard. Let me see that again. An operation in which the rows of one table, I just broke my toy, uh, are related to the rows of another through common column values is a join operation. Everybody's doing great on their databases today. This is true. I had to look right, well, this halfway up. Halfway through, so I'm going to say my other line. You can still join if you haven't joined yet. You can still win yes. as well. 
Social Sloth coming up or staying there, but we've got some people coming up. Gentle Seal on Agent Yak, not that far behind. You can still win this. Chat. You do have to press the buttons, not just type in chat. <laughs> yeah, press the buttons. You don't win if, you win if you're in chat. Uh, so the question now is an outer join between two tables where the only rows with ma okay let me try that again an outer join is i i typed this wrong between two tables is where the only rows with matching foreign and primary key values are returned wow is an outer join the join between where two rows with only the rows with the matching foreign and primary key values are returned wow that was awful and as you can see by my gif it's very difficult to find any sort of stock oh, image buddy. about an outer join yeah that was bad that's technically incorrect that is an inner join a, and a join form between two tables that in addition to including the rows for from the two tables with matching join column values will also include the values from one table that do not have the matching rows that's an outer join that is yeah. so wordy i hate that Ugh. yeah so outer joins kind of return absolutely everything and inner join kind of returns just the intersection yes so that that and thank you matt <laughs> Oh, you have to so be, like it's one of those things you just have to almost have a visualization of it to understand it. Yeah, it's kind of like a Venn diagram. Yes, and that's, and how, that's how we teach joins. Good to know. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Redis relies on disk storage database style mechanisms. Does Redis rely on a disk storage database style mechanism? I love yoga in chat. I hate databases now. I use Prisma. I don't know joins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is why you should write some raw SQL sometimes instead of using an RRM. <laughs> yes, yes, you should. And you should design like, yeah, this is false. Redis relies on in-memory storage. Redis is a in-memory database, whereas other databases tend to be disk storage. So that was how that one works. I can confirm this. I rebooted a Redis instance this morning and lost a lot of data. How do you pre how do you preserve Redis data then? I, I presume there's probably a proper way to like write it somewhere. I don't know. I just redeployed it and it lost everything. And I remember that Redis is in memory. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Next question. A primary key is a column or group of columns in a given table that uniquely identifies each row of the table. Okay, Brandon says you can persist it. You know, I'm sure that one day if I ever use a Redis database, like for actual production things, I will do it. Don't get me wrong. I love Redis. I think it's really nice. I've just never actually had to figure out how to persist it. So one Sounds day I will... Like you can just tell it to write to the disk like a normal database. <laughs> Probably. I wonder how you do that. I wonder how our managed database does it. Now I'm going to go learn stuff today because like I've used our managed Redis before for like key value storage and yeah. Social Sloth is on fire with eight correct answers in a row. Y'all, you still have it though. Uh, if, if if Social Sloth trips twice, yeah. Agent Yak climbing up the leaderboard. So yeah. Next question: A schema is a representation of the structure of a database. Oh hey, it's my favorite IDE. That is a webstorm. Oh, is that what that is? I just it, I, yeah. I put in schema and this is what came up and I'm like, this doesn't look like a database schema, but it looks close enough. No, it is. That is by the looks of it. That's WebStorm. Oh, uh, maybe it's not. Don't know. It's WebStorm do a schema or something. <laughs> uh, this is true. A schema is a representation of the structure of a database. Okay, I think we're at the last question. DigitalOcean offers four different managed database options. MySQL, Postgres, Redis, and MongoDB. Aww. A Sammy to finish this off. A Sammy <laughs> to finish this off every time. Does DigitalOcean offer four managed database options? They are, are they? MySQL, Postgres, Redis, and MongoDB. This is true. DigitalOcean offers four managed database offerings. Postgre MySQL, Postgres, Redis, and our latest is MongoDB, which we released not that long ago, right, Chris? Yeah, uh, MongoDB maybe three, four months ago. Yeah. It feels like it's pretty recent, but time just flies nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we just released that platform, and I got the notification yesterday that it's been a year. Really? So I, Yeah, uh, November. It, it, October 6th was when we released oh, that's it. Right. Yeah, that's it's been a year. Crazy. Wow. 
Okay, so if Social Sloth, you have one with 10 out of 10, perfect score. You know your databases. So congrats on winning. Uh, take a screenshot and send me an email at mason at digitalocean.com with your screenshot, Social Sloth. It include all of your uh, shipping information so I can send you some stickers. And if you've won before, let me know. Because I will, but I will also, I also know who has won before, so don't try to fool me. But yeah. Hey, congrats. That was a fun quiz. That was fun. And now I've got it. Now we've got, we've done, I'm surprised we've gone this long and not done databases, but that should tell you how I feel about databases. So, and now I have to find my notes. It is time for one of my favorite sections back in my day. And now it's time to look back fondly on the tech of yesteryear. I've got to remember to do my 1950s prospector voice. We have a tech of yesteryear with that segment back in my day. Like I got to do that old school 50s radio sound. In this segment, we take a look back on historical events in tech and marvel at just how far we've come and also feel old. Not Matt. He never feels old, but some of us might feel old. So we'll see. I feel old. I don't know how you can. So starting off with the first one, Chris, are you going to share for this? I am in. Yep. Sweet. So starting with our first one. Uh, how many <laughs> buttons? Say it again. We're just going to wait for Chris. There we go. Uh, on September 8th, 1966, an entire fandom was born as the first episode of Star Trek airs. Um, sci-fi shows have always been really interesting. Like I'm not really that much of a tricky, but a lot of our technological ideas and advancements have come from sci-fi shows. So it's always a good place and source of inspiration. So September 8th, 1966 was the first airing of Star Trek and the episode ran. The series ran until uh, September 2nd, 1969. Uh, and then they moved on to the 600 trillion other Star Trek franchises that there are. So, and I think of like most of them left, like William Shatner is like one of the only ones left or left around because Leonard Nimoy died last year, which was sad. So, anywho, if you're a Trekkie, let us know. Mr. Uh, Demon Wolf over in chat said, uh, shock the Twitch leak was not on the list. It was. We talked about it uh, in the news section. In the news, section. In the news section. It's not history yet. It's not history yet. If it happened yesterday, it's not history. I mean, it could, it might become, but yeah. Oh, look, he figured out that we did. Yeah, we did. We did. We talked about it. Okay, our next one, 9th, September 9th, 1947. This is one of my favorite things to just talk about. The first instance of an actual computer bug was found at 345. Admiral Grace Murray Hopper uh, records the first computer bug in the Harvard Mark II computer's logbook. The problem was traced to a moth stuck between relay contacts in the computer, which Hopper duly taped into the Mark II's logbook with the explanation, first actual case of bug being found. The bug was actually found by others, but Hopper made the logbook entry. So anyway, that is the first computer bug, and you can still see it on display in the Smithsonian. And that is where the term comes from. <laughs> so... I've never seen I, it. I have a question. Documented. It's worded here like first actual case of bug being found implies that they had the concept of a computer bug before this point. I don't know what uh, they probably just called error. Er, well, error or fault or failure. Because remember, remember, remember that computers at that time were very largely mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, whenever you have like a mechanical failure, you usually call it a fault or a failure. So maybe that's what they were yeah. calling it. But you know, it just seems like I, the term bug kind of came I here. Hear, I see what Matt's saying though. Like if I find a uh, an error in my code, I don't go first actual case of error. No, but this was the first actual case of a bug, like a but like a moth. Like that's where it and that's where it comes from. Like this was the first moth moth they found or insect. Yes, so it, it just implies the word bug was being used before this point. But I always thought this was when that concept was created. Yeah, who knows? I don't know. Well, we'll have to go and visit the Smithsonian and find out. Research. Let me go jump in my time machine. It's still pretty cool. Ah. September 12th, 1958 for our next. I'm not doing the transition. I'm doing a bad day today. Here we go. Got mail. So. Now, we, I, I, I love the you've got mail sound. We've got to use it. So our next one is September 12th, 1958, the beginning of all of this. The first test of an integrated circuit. Research Jack Kilby demonstrates the first integrated circuit to other researchers and executives at Texas Instruments. So 
Integrated circuits are basically the whole reason that we're sitting here streaming to you over the computer today. So it's a lot of fun. And it actually mm -hmm. looks kind of cool. Texas, it's interesting because like, I actually know where the Texas Instruments uh, headquarters is. It's not that far from where I grew up. And I used to drive by it on the way to like Academy. It's down there in Sugarland. But that's the first picture of an integrated circuit. I'm curious what this does. Yeah. I have no idea, but it looks kind of messy. But it I mean, it was the first one. First. <laughs> looks very much like a first. This is definitely a prototype. <laughs> And our next one comes into the land of mobile phones. On oh, September 23rd, 2008, the first Android was introduced. Google and T-Mobile introduced the T-Mobile G1, also known as the HTC Dream, the world's first Android-based smartphone. By raw sale numbers today, Android is the most popular, smart, popular smartphone platform. So yes, this one will probably make some of us feel a little bit more nostalgic. Uh, maybe that's what I should start doing is doing more that like, I don't think anybody in the chats was alive in 58. So, and if you are welcome, um, but yeah, first <laughs> Android was released. Um, and it's interesting because the iPhone was released in 2007. Like, so, so they took them about a year. I don't know how, I'm curious of how long they were working on it before then, or if they just decided, uh, what they were going if, if they decided that I wonder if the iPhone spurred development on Android and like this was a project in the coming, or yeah. you know, if they had already been working on it in the past. I'd be surprised if iPhone caused this to happen. Yeah. Like getting a whole new operating system out in a year feels because Maybe. There, was, there was these ideas before, like palm pads, and uh, there was another one, but yeah, I feel like they were working on it a while. Yeah, but the 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 touch based was not like that 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 wasn't really coming around at that point. It, I had to think back to it, it, freshman yeah, it year of high school. It wasn't the most touch intuitive though, you know. Like it it might have been a port. Yeah, mm. kind of like how uh, Mr. Demon Wolf says we talk about the first iPhone release. But both of both the first gen iPhone and first gen Android were awful. Like if you've ever read the story, Steve Jobs had to keep switching out iPhones during the presentation in his pocket because they kept crashing. Yeah. and running out of memory. So like he would go behind the desk and swap it out for a new one so the presentation looked better. Which I feel as someone who just went and watched Penn and Teller, thank you Chris. I feel like that's totally a magic show um of him just walking <laughs> back behind the desk and deciding to do that. Like that's that's I I I wonder if he actually like contracted them to teach them how to do sleight of hand. So And our next our last story comes out of the land of things that make gamers happy. I think it's is just uh, again thing that means we can be here streaming. True, true, but I'm not on I'm not on wired ethernet right now. So, ethernet well, is drafted. Away. Some well, I know, but I'm yeah. Ethernet <laughs> was drafted on September 30th, 1980. Digital Intel and Xerox released version 1.0 of the ethernet specification known as Blue Book. Since that time, ethernet has evolved into the de facto ne networking standard for local area networks in businesses and at home. So, 1980 is when we got the Ethernet to our internet because all the stuff we had before, like Vampire Wire and Circle Ring networking, things that most people haven't seen, but I went to a museum one time and I saw. Uh, it's pretty neat. So that's what we have right there. That is all we have for back in my day today. And you've got some mail. A bit of history. A little bit of history. So we now move into our last section of the day. What's on your mind? This is the fun little section of therapy that we do with each other every week to walk us through what's on your mind. And as always, we start with our British counterpart, Matt. Matt, how are you doing today? Uh, doing okay. Rage quit uni this morning. Um, <laughs> it was a databases lecture. Um, I ended up spending like, quite a while arguing with our lecturer. They were in... This is the issue we have at uni. They're very uh, Windows only and live in the world of Microsoft. So when we talk about databases, the only thing they know is Microsoft Access, um, Ooh. which is nasty in it, on its own. Um, we just had we had a bit about uh, relationships between database for, between tables and databases. They were convinced that a foreign key is able to know whether it's a one to one or one to many relationship. <laughs> and I had to spend quite a long time explaining to them that a foreign key does not know and does not care. <laughs> and they just couldn't get it. They were determined that because their little diagram in Access showed it, that the foreign key knew. Oh my god. And I just lost it. 
I rage quit. So we're, we're sitting here talking about, do you need a degree? And then you go to places that are like, we're going to teach you access and C++. And you're like, that's I, great. I My university taught me C++. And you want to know how much C++ code I've written since I graduated? None, presumably. Not a line. Good. Zero. I've written more C than I've written C++, not by choice. Uh, every now and then something, and I have to I have to write a Python C binding, and I cry myself to sleep that night. Um, <laughs> Better but, with C++ as well. Why yeah. <laughs> That's the yeah I, you know I could go on this rant but that's that I I'm all, I sit on the industrial advisory board at a university uh, because I, I'm a, I'm an alumni I'm like they want to know how can they make the program better mm. and sometimes like I feel like we have to be, stay up to date in our field yes. um, and I feel like professors need to have that requirement as well because I literally argued with a professor who said he was not going to teach fad technologies such as Git. <laughs> Oh dear. Oh. <laughs> oh dear. And I SBN. was like and I'm like and I was like good your students are not going unhirable. to get jobs. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely unhirable. So I yeah, yeah Rex, that, that's yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I generally don't. I tend to just like mute the team's call and not pay attention at all. But I was just like you can I, I just lost it cuz <laughs> not not this one. Oh, well, it's not just the rest it. of the class has just been taught literally misinformation i i just can't sit there and listen to that yeah it you're you're close to done though yeah matt yeah this last semester he so. just has to don't do anything don't jeopardize it matt just shut up and get through it <laughs> like if you're two months out my friend six more <laughs> weeks of lectures to go two weeks of exams and then i'm done you are almost out just just hold your nose and then you can then you can write a book about it okay i can yeah so, I said I, I chat with some of the, my with the friends at uni, like, and they obviously they know I have a job here, and they ask me like, how what do you think about this in comparison to the real world? And I I am quite frank with them, like, I wouldn't hire any of them, <laughs> knowing what they get taught at uni. It's just, they're not hireable. Well, that's the yeah. thing. That's the thing about universe. Like computer science programs have decided that they want to teach concepts and not real world tools, mm -hmm. because because they if they if they constantly changed, they'd never you know the, the place. To, so I get that, but like actively just teaching wrong or not not updating your your lecture information every thirty years, um, just seems foolish. So I like. I don't know. I get it. Like there was a couple classes I took in university that I like networking. I learned a lot in my networking yes. class, but you, it's expected when you graduate from a university that you're going to learn all new stuff at your first job. When we hire a new engineer, we expect you to know nothing, but we expect you to at least know if statements for loops and maybe a data structure. <laughs> it turns yeah. out, you know, that was a very challenging concept. Some people in my uni just like dealing with basic concepts, if statements and stuff. <sighs> I'm just going to go cry. Um, Chris, what's on your mind? Because I feel like I, if, if I fall down this rabbit hole, I'm never getting out of it. <laughs> yeah, so Chris, I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, a little bit on that too. Like, do we feel like there's more in the future of like the boot camps and the kind yes. of the targeted um, trade, almost trade school types thing? Well, that's like what <sighs> used to be, right? Yeah. Before university became a thing, you have polytechnics and stuff that taught far more real world skills. Yeah. You know, I can see it. Like, it I think it depends on the role. I, I but I do feel like yes. The the problem is is that at least American computer education expects everyone to go into research. Like, we mm -hmm. teach our undergraduate programs like everyone's getting a PhD, which ninety nine point nine percent of the population is not doing. So mm -hmm. we're like, and I I'm, I I like I go to this industrial advisory board meeting every year, and I get into a fight with these professors every year. The good thing is there are a few good ones that listen and are trying. But I I, I actually think that like. Like associate's degrees. Like I know friends that have like MI. So De Dennis, you were talking about um, certain degrees and like IT degrees. Those, those don't exist in a computer science program. But if you go to a community college or an associate or a, a, a two year college in, 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 in the States, you can get like information systems, which is where you'll learn about networking and DHCP and like how to route stuff, like do an actual IT stuff, which I will argue is actually required to do CS, but CS majors never touch that. Um, so you can do it like that. So yeah, I agree with you, Chris. I think eventually we're going to get to the, that, that mo for most software engineering, it's a trade school kind of thing. And if you need to do that kind of stuff where you're developing advanced algorithms and stuff, 
go get a master's and then that'll be the barrier for that, you know, but 99% of us are never going to write a, a merge sort algorithm again in our lives, unless it comes up in an interview. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, that's um, the thing that was me is you just interviews ask for the stuff that doesn't matter to the work. No, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, what's on my mind? I think mine's a little bit kind of weird. I was messing with AI last night and open AI, uh, GPT-3 type stuff. And I I just got to like, I, I tweeted about it, but let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, of how ridiculous these things are. So this is my tweet. And I asked AI to tell me about Jupiter. And these are the responses I got. So I got Jupiter's really big. This one makes sense, right? And then mm -hmm. same exact prompt. Um, there's like a little bit of variability, so it gives you a different answer every time. And then you get, which is still fine, right? But then you get this one. <laughs> wow. And it's like, sure. what? <laughs> and then this was the fourth one, which I mean, sounds so wise, but has nothing to do with Jupiter. Um, <laughs> okay, now I know. Now I know how Panda Express generates their fortune cookies. Oh, <laughs> that'd be a great service. It would be. We'll like, go buy a domain. G oh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> AI fortunes. <laughs> so did, that. So was this just like you playing with APIs or stuff, or you didn't like you didn't like build any models or anything, did you? No, 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 not yet. Um, this was just me playing with OpenAI's uh, defaults, which they yeah. have a pretty big data set. Uh, I think the biggest in the AI land. I just interesting. I want to know like how it got to that sentence, which is I know is a stupid question to ask in the world of AI, but like how? Well, the one about yeah. the one about insanity and like and deities is kind of a, I, I I can see it because yeah. Jupiter's the name of I think Zeus in Roman yeah. mythology so yeah. I can see like like it's a stretch it's but, a stretch like, I can see that one yeah but I can see it the the one about hot and cold water that one I'm a little bit weirded out by but yeah I I mean Neptune has a lot of uh I guess connection with water healing um but yeah, I don't know. I thought it was just fun and I'm kind of experimenting more to see if there's like a business that you can build out of it. There have been already a few businesses that have been built and sold or raised money out of AI. And I feel like it's the new buzzword kind of like NFT and crypto. Oh, it is AI and, and <laughs> machine. AI and ML have been the buzzword for a minute now. Like, yeah, but at least they're useful. Unlike NFTs and crypto. Oh, Matt, Matt over here going to start a firestorm in the chat. <laughs> okay, Dennis, what's on your mind? What are you thinking about today? Yeah. Uh, um, no, I spaced out a little bit because uh, earlier uh, I realized that I'm staying in a room currently trying to make the lighting cool, to make the lighting as good as I can, seeing what is behind Chris and... I realize I am staring at one big lighting uh, circle. That's everything I have in front of me. And I got a little bit buzzed by all of this and got a little bit of stage fright at some point. But uh, yeah, <laughs> my first live stream, you know, I don't know if that's how you felt in your first live stream, but maybe it's normal. You're doing better than I did in my first live stream. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, yeah. Chris, you can remember your first live stream? Uh, it was like three, four years ago. I don't remember it going past five minutes. So you're doing good. <laughs> I don't yeah. remember mine at yes. all. I think it might've been honestly when I started here, like my first, my first Terraform talk, but. Did you talk about Terraform in your first, uh, yeah. Live talk? Yeah. I think my very, well, right. my first, my first streaming talk. <laughs> I talked about Terraform. I have done. I had done conference talks um, many years prior. No, no. I, I was talking to one of my friends the other day because um, she does a lot of live demos on stage, and I've realized that I've become way too confident in live demos because I de I live demo things that we have network dependencies. 
Um, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the laws of live demoing say that you should never do that um, because it will go down. So everything local. Yeah. Um, so maybe I've become a little bit too confident in my own abilities. But yes, my very first one was my very first DigitalOcean live stream was like an hour long webinar of like me doing a lot of Terraform. I actually I did. I had four different Terraform things that I did um, and I don't know how I managed it. I do have a question for you, Dan. Uh, on your live stream, live coding, do you Google stuff? Don't you feel uh, Googling is bad when you're live streaming? No. Do you have to know everything by heart? Or? No, no. So 100% no. So whenever I do live codings for tech talks, I tend to have worked through them beforehand and I have a GitHub repository that has all of the code. So that way, for the sake of time, like I can get through it. So like that's if I'm doing a tech talk with DigitalOcean. If I'm doing a personal live stream where I am coding and like like on twitch like a twitch live stream versus a webinar um mm -hmm. i 100 show what i'm googling because i don't want to reinforce the narrative that we don't google and that that i just know all this off the top of my head i don't i know very little of this off the top of my head and if i need to google it i'll google it and i will show people what i'm googling because i want people that are watching to know that it's okay to have to google and ask the internet questions for stuff like that's yeah. a, it's a it's a requirement and of the job and and yeah. if you reverse it too, and you find somebody that you like look up to that you're watching their live stream and they Google for it, that just like puts me at ease because it's like oh you know they Google and they're and they're fine with it, right? Um, oh, also, it, it helps there's a more yeah. than yeah, it helps everybody. There's a lot to be seen and like teaching people how to Google. Like this is how I Google for stuff. This is how I weed out the bad answers. This is how I f like. How do I find a problem when I'm stuck? A lot of times, like it's a school. It's a skill that you can actually learn a lot from if you watch somebody. But how often do you go into university class? The professor's like, "We're just going to Google for 50 minutes today." <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen. I, I also the cool thing about live stream is if you are open to just being, I guess showing errors and showing bugs more often than not people in chat will actually help you and write your code for you which <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's more pair programming than live streaming sometimes yeah so i would not be intimidated by it i wouldn't i would do it 100 percent. i think it's a great thing to do i will say the other thing about live streaming doing coding is that it stops you getting distracted because there is yeah. a tiny bit of mental pressure you know people are watching me yeah. code so I don't just stop and open Twitter every five minutes. <laughs> yeah. I've done that on stream before. <laughs> it's like, I'm tired. I'm taking, I'm taking a social media break. You can sit here and we can laugh at memes together. Uh, oh, dear. What's in your mind? Oh, I don't know. Um, honestly, it's Hectoberfest. Like, I'm trying to get my stuff all organized and... Like I thought, I thought I got I got back from a long vacation, which was nice, and I had to, and I basically got back the day of Hacktoberfest, and I jumped right into the deep end, and now I'm over here doing all that, and it's you know it's slowed down a lot. Like once the program gets going, it's not as much, but like now I'm over here trying to figure out what am I going to do PRs against, what am I going to work on this this October, so doing a, doing a lot of that, and then mostly just trying to get back in the flow of things. It, it, I feel like I'm like. Not behind, but I feel like I'm very reactionary in my work right now. Where like I don't feel like I'm like I planned ahead. So it's mostly just that. It's been a it's been a weird like getting back into the flow of work, but I think I finally got there like yesterday. So that's nice. Oh good. Well, at least yeah. you enjoyed your break. Yes, I had a good break. I, I always say that everyone needs to take uh, uh, whatever vacation you took this year, double it. That's how much you should actually be taking. Um so, uh, zero. Zero times zero with Matt. <laughs> zero. <laughs> Matt, I, if I was if I was your manager, Matt, I would disconnect your access and be like, "You're on vacation." Yeah, no, I I want to take a break. I, it's just zero point in me taking a break until uni's done because if I take a break, it's not a break. I still have a uni. That makes sense. You know, you've got a lot of you've got a, you've still when you still have a lot of that going on but i hope that you get to go and take a break and i don't know wander aimlessly around the english countryside and look at cows for a while i am looking forward to christmas and new year we know you need to worry about i can take time off from work and i can just enjoy a proper british winter what is a proper british winter lots of very cold walks outside in the frosty countryside you know that does sound kind of refreshing 
I think awesome. That's it. Well, I think that's all we have for what's on your mind today. We'll go through our upcoming events. Um, it is still Hacktoberfest, everyone. Get your PRs. If you haven't signed up yet, you can go to hacktoberfest.digitalocean.com. Sign up, and if you, as either a maintainer or a contributor this year, so mm -hmm. you can do either or, and get your uh, get your contributions and get that either and you know plant a nice tree or get a T-shirt. Your choice. Plot the tree. I don't know. I don't know, Matt. That T-shirt's nice. Like, I have. I have so a hard. So is a tree. I, I. I. Matt. Okay. I will get this. I plant your own tree. I love planting yes, trees. I have. I have land to plant trees on. So I'm going to plant one in my backyard this year for Hacktoberfest. Sure. So. I saying if you win a T-shirt, you can also just plant a tree in our online forest anyway. If you donate. Oh, I'll do that. That sounds fun. I like planting trees. <sighs> this week we have a couple of live streaming events. Uh, I don't I think Shahar live streams on Mondays. Kim live streams on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern. Chris live streams every other Wednesday. So, Chris, I think you're doing it next week on Twitch. I start next week. That's right. Next week at Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And I am actually live streaming today at some time because I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, I like, uh, is it Saswat in chat? It says, um, you know, why is Matt's video off? And then it leads into... Matt's voice sounds like a robot. Is Matt is an AI? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think. Well, may maybe, maybe there's like the the British Google Home version. Maybe that kind of sounds like him. So, <laughs> but my live stream is at two o'clock Eastern today. It'll be on the DigitalOcean Twitch channel, which is DigitalOcean or Twitch TV slash DigitalOcean TV. Um, so yeah, I'll be honestly probably working on Hacktoberfest stuff. Probably some GoLang stuff. I have a PR that I need to review, so I'm probably going to be doing that. Um, next week we have a tech talk, which is getting started with Kubernetes on DigitalOcean. That will be a joint tech talk with myself and Kim, where Kim is going to teach me how to do Kubernetes. That's going to be fun. Oh, that's going to be a brilliant tech talk. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. That's going to be fun. And then next week is KubeCon, where DigitalOcean will have a virtual booth. We'll have like a gather.town where you can come and interact with us. We'll have a lot of really cool new things going on uh just at, at events and swag giveaways and all sorts of stuff so if you're going to kubecon we will be there virtually at our virtual booth kim will also be giving a talk which chris and i've already seen and it's a fantastic talk so you should definitely go see kim's talk um but next week is kubecon north america and i hope that if you get to go you enjoy it and you come by and say hi at the booth and yeah. that is all of the events we have all the stuff we have for this week oh we should it's say cloud chats next week is KubeCon, Different. yes. Cloud Chess next week is KubeCon, so it will be Kim and a whole bunch of KubeCon people, so Chris, myself, and Matt are taking the week off, which is nice. Um, but next week will be a very specific KubeCon and Kubernetes themed Cloud Chat, so you definitely want to tune in for that to get some more swag, because they'll be doing probably another true or false for some swag. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And so, now, it's time for the best time of the week. Favorite bit of the show. It's time for my joke. And I've kind of run out of tech jokes, so now you just get really bad puns. So, but it's fine. Down for it. <laughs> okay. So, how do you fix a broken pumpkin? How? With a with a pumpkin patch. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I hope seasonal that you have enjoyed that. Seasonal, that. Yeah. seasonal puns. That's what I'm going with. So thank you everyone for joining us for Cloud Chats. Next week, special edition KubeCon Cloud Chats with Kim and a whole bunch of really cool people from like Sneak and a whole bunch of other cool companies. You're not going to want to miss it. So you will hopefully, we'll hopefully see you about back again next week. Words are hard. It's hard. See you next week. See you see next you. week. Right. Bye.